Mike Shafted, welcome to Guildcast, another episode number 18 for April 12, 2012. You're watching GameBreaker.tv, and today we're going to talk a little bit. Let's see, ArenaNet is uh, taking all our monies. I'm broke, and for once and for all, I'm not making a joke about the microtransactions. Finally, I'm really not joking about it. Uh, John Peters talks traits in a new interview, and of course, as always, your viewer questions, all that and more, but first up this week... Game Breaker writer extraordinaire, Mr. Jason Winter. How are you, sir? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing great. I'm so nervous. This is my first time on this show. I, 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 I just... That's okay. Is, 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 the Guru fans will cut you. That's, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> As I said, they'll, they'll cut me and then they'll swap up and they'll cut me again. Exactly. And then you'll be downed and then they will fatality you. Just, uh, just yeah. make sure you yep. get everything wrong. It'll be a perfect and episode. Wow, my close-up. Dang. All right. Hang on. <laughs> Pull it back a little Better. bit. All right. Yeah. Work on that production video. Right. And from Massively, from Massively.com, we haven't met, but pleasure to meet you, Richard Procopio. How are you, Richie? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Glad to have you back. You've been kind of a superstar on this show since I've been gone. People love you. Thanks. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's good to have somebody been a big around. Fan for a long time. Well, it's good to have somebody around here who knows what he's talking about. So, you know, figure out somebody that actually like on this show. Exactly, you know. It's not going to be you or me. It's a terror show? What are we doing here? Oh. He said it. He said it. All right. So first up, big news this week, of course. Everybody knows, unless you've been living under a rock, Guild Wars 2, the pre-purchase is now available. And uh, yes, I said pre-purchase, not uh, not pre-order. Very big difference. We talked about this uh, in past episodes. Pre-purchase. you got to purchase it, purchase it, purchase it. Not order it for like the five bucks. you got to go in for the full deal. Uh, but the big thing is it gets you into the, all of the uh, future beta weekend events, of course. Uh, I'm going to assume that everybody on this panel's credit card is just a little bit lighter this week. Richie? It's on fire. On fire? On fire. <laughs> yeah, I actually drove around like a crazy madman and had to pre-purchase a collector's edition. So, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely hurting a little bit. You went for the collector's edition, as did I. As did I. I, I think it's worth it. I mean, everybody's like going crazy about the price, but it's, it's kind of it's a pretty good package. How about you, Jason? I, I was this close to buying the collector's edition. You didn't do I, it. I weaseled out at the last minute. I just went for the digital deluxe. You were strained. You were like the economy. I did. Bad. I did somehow manage. Game breaker doesn't pay a dime, and <laughs> you, they give me. I give there's, blood. There's, there's no. There's no room in my cage for that uh, white lock statue. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got to go for the collector's edition. You know, I need my little little toys and trinkets, and I need a box to throw if it sucks. Right? I gotta. I, it's a metal one. It's a metal one. So if it it's sucks, a metal one. Arena Net, if the game is terrible, you will get thrown in the studio, as I do with some other boxes. You don't want to get on that box. That's the wall of the I, box I hope, of shame. I hope you get I hope you have good insurance for Shaft Net. <laughs> take a metal box to the noggin. Oh, that'll make a nice sound. Uh, also, so Arena Net put out a, uh, a video here this week to, uh, to entice people to throw down their money for the collector's edition, showing off everything that's in it. What do you guys think about the price point? 150 bucks. A lot of people are saying it's you know a little bit high. It is a little bit more than most. Um, that was the that was the same price as Swotor, right? 150. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. But what do you guys think? Yeah. I mean, the, you, get, you get this, you know, you get the 10 inch figurine, which that's got to be like a 10 inch figurine like this. If it's high quality, it's got to be a good 70, 75 bucks, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the detail on that thing and how huge it is. I mean, it's actually, they, there was some video I saw that they compared the size of that figure to all the other collector edition, like, statuettes. It's it's gigantic. Um, unfortunately, this is becoming the new price point for, for a lot of the big uh, game collector's editions. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Skyrim was the same kind of, you know, price point. So it, it's the standard fare, but you do get a lot for it. You know, that, that art, that uh, the, the making of Guild Wars book is going to be gorgeous. You get the soundtrack. The art prints with the frame, that's the key. You, know, you always get these prints or these posters or whatever, and you have no, nothing to do with them. But they give you the frame, so it's all done for you. I think it's a good deal, too. I did, too, because I feel yeah, I mean, like... I was, Go ahead, Jason. I was, saying, I, was, I, was compare, I was comparing it that way when I was trying to debate which one I wanted. It's like, do I want to spend the extra $70? And just thinking of those three things, the, the, the book, 
the statue and the uh, the soundtrack. I figured each of them at least you know twenty thirty dollars a piece probably. So you know it seems like a reasonable deal. And I gotta say I'm a big fan of getting the figurines in in some of these. You know the the Bl Blizzard for a while I guess kind of had the collector's edition model. It's like kind of the standard package: the Starcraft, the World of Warcraft. They were all the same. You know you got the book. And I feel like I always got like stuff that like I looked through the book and the book was awesome and I would totally pay like twenty bucks maybe in the bookstore or something but it's a lot of stuff that I don't want to touch and I just keep in the box like I don't really use the mouse pad because you don't want to dirty it up and get your hand scum all over it, right so I feel like it's always a bunch of stuff that I don't use and I can't even like put out and display whereas I'd rather pay the extra buck couple bucks and get the figurine and you know I need I got my little thrall I need, you need a collection. Yeah, the, the the way I look at it is, you know, my first year of buying World of Warcraft with the you know subscription fee, I spent over two hundred dollars. So dropping down one hundred and fifty bucks now and not having a sub fee, hey, it's a bargain. Yeah, I don't think I've ever even bought anything beyond a basic box. So even just doing this was, and I'm a noted cheapskate. So even this was something. For me. <laughs> Jason Winter, <laughs> noted cheapskate. <laughs> it's my title. It's over my head. And the one thing about these things, these these guys, this, the collector's editions are not uh, um, like numbered or limited, correct? I don't believe, I don't they believe are. that. I don't believe they're numbered. They might be limited in that. They, I mean, I know that a lot of people in uh, Europe are having a hard time finding them. Uh, they they can't even, you know, all the stores are sold out. So uh, it might not be a limited, you know, number in terms of being number it number. But you know, finding them might be a different story for some folks. Arena Net hates Europe. That's what I've heard. They, <laughs> Arena Net hates Europe. This just in. No, just kidding. Where did you? Uh, where did you end up pre-ordering from? I know this is a big decision for a lot of people as well because they were sort of. Uh, who? Which one were they not sort of endorsing? Is it Amazon? Well, I believe. Yeah, a Amazon. At least in certain regions, in the United States was one of them. They, they didn't have the ability. I think to charge your full card, you know, in advance. So then they couldn't actually give them the pre-purchase benefits. They actually had to, uh, you know, if you pre-order through Amazon, they don't charge your card until it's actually released. So, so they actually didn't didn't support the pre-purchase. I don't believe. So I got mine through, uh, you know, GameStop was on the on the day they announced. It was the only day you could actually get. It was the only place you can get the collector's edition in the United States was through GameStop. I think Best Buy is now going to be able to do that as well. But that wasn't the case a couple of days ago. Yeah, I had a really bad experience with Amazon on the Star Wars The Old Republic Collector's Edition. I actually missed out uh, on my Collector's Edition. It was a just giant mess. So I'm going GameStop. I'm going GameStop. That's all I got to say. I think they said Best Buy is going to have them starting Friday. Yeah. going to be taking the orders. So. Yeah, that's what I heard as well. Uh, also this week, Guild Wars 2 Hub spoke uh, with ArenaNet's John Peters at PAX. PAX, PAX, PAX just ended last weekend. They had a really good interview up there. You guys should check it out. It's mostly focused on the trade system. I believe, was that you, Jason, who uh, also wrote that up on Game Yeah, Breaker? I, I did yes, it on that. Yes, yes, yes. Me and Shafnet, I think. We're all up on that. Game Breaker TV, all up on that Guild Wars 2 news. It's called Guild Breaker. That's what we're going to change the name to. Should I just buy that URL right now? <laughs> Guild, Guild Breaker. Guild Breaker. Actually, more, this, this week, more like Guild Boober. <laughs> yes. Guild, Guild, Guild Wars 2 and boobs seems to be what everybody wants these days. <laughs> uh, but there's a few interesting um, tidbits here that we pulled out from this interview. First up, John says... Uh, He's talking about traits again. He says, there's a warrior trait that when you take falling damage, you do this stomp and send everyone flying. And that one was the first idea on those. We were like, this is awesome. So we kind of kept that up. How awesome is that falling damage? We're used to just like, you know, oh, that sucked. I'm almost dead. But you're actually going to have an ability based on your fall. This is going to be like a tactic, right? Well, it makes sense. If you're, if you're a guy in big heavy plate mail and you drop on a squishy, you, you should hurt them. You should. <laughs> have I we ever that, that really hurting? But have we ever seen? That's why you have those big spiked shoulder pads or whatever in a lot of games. The pauldrons. The damage. Have Have you guys ever noticed? I, I've never. I don't think I've ever heard of a trait being activated by the environment in an MMO like this. Now it's pre it's pretty cool that they have that tech. I mean, they, they've actually put out a couple other abilities too. Like the mesmer has one called Descent into Madness, and when they take falling damage, it actually creates a chaos storm around them, which is an AOE field that gives conditions and different things to, to people around you. So it's, it's cool that they have that mechanic and are able to, to do some creative abilities with it. Do you guys think we'll see more of this? Do you think that like, if these become a lot of fun that we'll actually end up seeing more traits that just kind of interact with the environment? 
it, it's tough to figure out what else you'd do with it. I mean, one one thing I'm just maybe thinking off the top of my head, I don't know if there's any. Uh, I don't know if there's much in there that was like knockback or anything. Maybe something like that, that lets you rebound off a surface and jump out and hit somebody. Now you're just talking that crazy talk. Dodge, roll, hit a uh, wall, maybe run up the side of the wall. What is that called from uh, – what is that style of running called, like that game? Parkour. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, parkour. All of a sudden it's yeah, like, you know, go. Guild Wars 2's got parkour built into it. Yeah, that'd be great. You think a char could do that? Kind of got that cat thing going, all the nimble and everything. That's what I mean, right? And it, and my, the big question since I read this, I was like, what, what happens if you jump into water? Do you cannonballs, like AOE splash damage or something? <laughs> <laughs> right? You get everybody wet and they can't WA space. W A space. Look at Jason with the inside gameplay jokes. Go watch gameplay right here on Game Breaker TV with me, Mike Schaffin, and Mike B. W A space. What is that from? That was from Trine. W A space. W A space. I'm down. I'm down. Uh, next up, John uh, talked a little bit. He said uh, the racial stuff. We're, we aren't going to allow in PvP. Then it creates this thing where you have to be a Norn warrior or whatever. So I think this was definitely. I don't know if you, what you guys think, but this is definitely seems like a smart move. I mean. It's pretty much been the norm. The trend has been the norm for MMOs of late to to, to not make racial abilities uh, usable in PvP. Just kind of make them fluff abilities, things like that. Uh, I'm pretty glad to see that they're following suit here. How about you, Jason? That's just someone in chat saying charcoal. Charcoal. Char running off the wall. <laughs> I mean, that's perfect. That's perfect. But yeah, it, it's been the trend lately in MMOs to not really tie in race to abilities beyond you know fluff or appearance or something like that, and it's. Yeah, you know, that's just kind of the way it has to be now. It has to be. Is it only because of the competitive nature, Richie, that like people will kind of freak out if we're not on a level playing field? I mean, because some people would probably argue and say, like, well, I like the difference that like certain you know racials would give a, a little bit of an up here, a little bit of an up there. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad that they're doing it this way, and that they 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 are giving each race several you know flashy kind of abilities to, to actually make them feel distinct, and they're not kind of holding it back. You know, by 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 taking that out of PvP allows them to kind of do this. I mean, some of them are amazing. I mean, getting into you know the story, getting into the Golem battle suit, or you know the char the Charzuka, where you know you actually hit that skill and it replaces your first five action bars. You've got five new abilities to to nuke people with this new weapon. And I'm glad that they're they're actually putting in these big flashy things and that they're. You know, they can balance it by not allowing it to, you know, to be in PvP, so you don't have everybody being the same thing, you know, because it's the most powerful. So I like the way that they're doing it. How about it, how about if ArenaNet were to uh, give female characters minus one strength and male characters minus one intellect? What do you think of that? <laughs> I mean, well, that's a controversy. And the male character gets minus ten intellect when the female character is standing in front of them with the chainmail bikini or something. Sure. <laughs> You have the chainmail bikini in Swotor, don't you, Jason? I know you do. You've been, so, you've been I, up those social points for months. I've got it on my, my Eric Jorgen, my trooper <laughs> character. All right, <laughs> moving on. Uh, John said that uh, for really hardcore balancing, people talk about PvP balance, but I think PvE balance would be harder and more important because there is a lot more to consider, like the in-game economy. It's not that the PvP balance isn't important or hard, it's both. But with PvP balance, you have certain shifts and counters. So the metagame can counter certain ability, certain balance elements, but you can't really do that in PvE. What do you think about this, Rich? I mean, isn't the hardest part for ArenaNet really going to be how to balance both, both sides of the game to work together? Yeah, it depends on what kind of tactic they're really taking. I mean, we saw in, in World of Warcraft, they're trying to, you know, they wanted your character to kind of use the same abilities and feel really the same regardless of whether you were doing PvE or PV, uh, PvP. Um, so it depends if they're going to go that route or if they're going to go the route where they're just going to say, all right, well, certain things just don't work in PvP. That's a PvP skill versus a PvE skill. And they, both systems have different advantages and disadvantages. What I like about what he's saying here, though, is that... Um, you know, they, in PvP, there's not that it's more, you know, less difficult to balance, but there's almost it's it's, all, it's almost self-regulating. There's checks and balances in place because if players figure out a certain build or certain profession combos or whatever that seem to start working out wet, uh, well, then that kind of becomes the the meta game that people kind of draw towards, and then then people get a little bit predictable. And when people get predictable, you can actually build counters to those, you know, to that meta game. And so it kind of, you know, the the the, the traits and skills that are used are gonna, you know. Know, fluctuate depending on the metagame and that, that's it's self-regulating we're on the PVE side if they do something like that if they figure out a way to beat you know 
the hard dungeons really, really uh, easily. Um, th there's no real check to that without Arena that actually stepping in and, and per making performance balance change. So I, I think that was an interesting uh, little bit of insight he gave there. Jason, what do you think? I thought it was kind of interesting that it sound, sounded like they don't really have to do a whole lot to balance between the between PVE and PVP. Is that what, that what you guys kind of got from it too, that they're not having to do a whole lot? I mean, I don't know if I got it. There's not a whole lot, but... Because, because of the, the thing that I think that everyone really notices in PvP is stuff like is CC. You know, stuns, you know, you, you get stun locked in, in games. I mean, it's, we've all had it happen to us in Swotor or Rift. It happens a ton in Lotro PvP. And if I'm not mistaken, there really aren't any hard stuns in Guild Wars 2 unless there's a lot of debuffs, a lot of stuff that might slow you or whatever or blind you, but you, you still get to keep playing the game. I hate when I'm in PvP and, you know, I can go and grab a sandwich for 15 seconds or 15 minutes while I'm, while I'm being stunned, but I, I think because they don't have as much of that in PvP, in, in Guild Wars 2, that, that helps them not need to, to balance stuff between. He also mentions, uh, uh, Richie, you have something? Well, I was, was going to... Uh, no, no. I was gonna. I was gonna say that they might just be breathing a sigh of relief because in Guild Wars One, they could have a. You can have a secondary profession, which basically meant every character had access to every skill in the game in one form or another. And I could just imagine after the nightmare of that balancing that, they might be looking at this going, you know, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> like we crunched <laughs> those numbers. This is nothing. Uh, right. He also talked about how much of a nightmare that was. <laughs> He also mentions the economy here. I, do you guys see any signs of like you know uh, any of the crafting professions being a step ahead of any of the others here? I don't know too much about uh, you know what you're going to be able to craft you know towards towards the end of each of the tiers. But what I find interesting about the crafting system is while you can only have two active crafting disciplines. Um, you can switch them by, you know, talking to a master crafter and paying a fee, and you don't lose any of the progress from the previous profession that you had or the previous crafting discipline that you Thank had. You and you also retain all of the recipes. So um, if, if they do, if there is some sort of imbalance, but one makes more money or something like that, you'll see everyone flock to it really quickly. And uh, uh, I think it's interesting that everyone can, in the long run, max out every single one of the crafting disciplines. Uh, so that's going to have an interesting impact on the game. You big crafter, Jason? Yeah, I am. I haven't really paid much attention to it, though, in Guild Wars 2. Just, uh, I, I, I just dislike how crafting is usually something you kind of do along the way until you get to max level, and then you, then you really need it. Maybe with them doing the things where they, it's the leveling curve is a little different in Guild Wars 2, and it's not all about the end game, etc. Maybe it'll be a little better, I hope. Maybe. It'd be nice if they bring back crafting in a way that really, really, really just makes it super important. Like, we're really relying on crafters and community for people. I, I really hope that that kind of works out with this, uh, with this economy and the whole system. Have, I mean, we, we've seen some of the crafting in the game already, but uh, Richie, can you get a sense for if that's actually going to take place? Do you think people are really going to be uh, out researching and finding those top crafters on their server? Uh, well, I, I, the, craft, the crafting uh, weapons and the armor sets and stuff like that, that you can make from it are going to have unique skins to them. So that if you want to look a certain way, you want to look like you actually spent a lot of time in the crafting, um, you know, you, you can customize your armor. And they're going to have, you know, since the, the, the gear level at the at max level is going to be at a plateau, you can get the statistically best kind of coolest looking gear, you know, through crafting. Um, yeah, it's 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 going to be a way to differentiate yourself if you're one of those mega crafters. And with like the transmutation stones and stuff, being able to combine um, the looks of items, kind of like transmog and wow. Um, yeah, you can really you're, you should be able to um, really see that. You know, hey, that guy actually maxed out. You know, his crafting and all those different things because look, he's walking around with those uber sets and stuff like that. So you crafting? I, think that you, like, I hate crafting. My, I hate it. I can't know, stand some, it. There's a completionist side to me that just, you know, when I, when I heard the announcement that you can actually switch professions and keep all your progress, I was like, no, that's going to make me do all of oh, them. Oh, <laughs> you you're just like, you have to do that? Yeah. Uh, I can't, you're, you're, you, you hate underwater combat, too. But no, those, those, I, I am... Make you love everything. I, I did some underwater combat. I'm sold on that now. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad it was fast-paced. Well, cool. You're going you're to love crafting, too. I, I don't know if I'm sold on crafting it. I've never really liked it. <laughs> How about underwater crafting? Underwa basket weaving? Un underwater, basket weaving. underwater basket weaving. I, if they put that in the game, I will do it. But I don't know.
don't know. I've, I've always been the guy who just collects mats and just sells them, makes the coin, get other people to. to you know what it is? It's, it, it just, it's just. I got. I actually liked crafting. I'm, I'm old school like that. You can see my gray hair. I'm old. I played old school MMOs where it was like it was more a little bit. It was a little tougher, and it was more of a game that you were doing something. And po- sometimes some games you could die, right? You could like take damage and things like that. Those types of crafting scenarios I kind of liked a little bit more, especially when you could attach your name to things and get things out in the world. SWG. Um, but after World of Warcraft and stuff, it was just like. It's a waste of time. I'm just clicking this thing and just like click and sit back and drink a soda. I've never played a game where I could die during crafting. <laughs> that, that's a new one for me. Wait, couldn't you, couldn't didn't didn't you take you took damage in EQ too? Didn't you? It's like like uh, well, I, I'm, again, I, I think I'm thinking of like you were trying to sew something. You stab yourself with a needle and and you you know, I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hey man, underwater basket weaving is, is well, dangerous. You can there, it's dangerous you go, stuff. Yeah. It's dangerous work. Uh, really quickly, I want to tell you guys about donations. Uh, we run a lot of what we do here at GameBreaker.tv on donations. And uh, actually, because of your donations, first of all, thank you so much for donating. But because of your donations, we're actually moving studios uh, tomorrow and through the weekend. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take some pictures and some video. I'll show you guys what we're doing. But we're moving downstairs. We're staying in the same building. We're moving downstairs, a little bit bigger of a space. We need some more room. Going to build out some cool stuff. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all your donations. If you guys like what we do here on Guildcast or any of the other shows or the news hits that we do at GameBreaker.tv, please, I urge you to come on over to GameBreaker.tv. There's a little donate button there. You can click it and send us a buck, two bucks, five bucks, whatever you can. It all really helps us to keep this train going and on the track. And thank you so much. All right, so next up, John said, I think the important thing within our system is trying to introduce a number of builds so that there are a good number of builds for everything. So now there are a couple of different support necros, a couple of damage necros, and a couple of good defense necros. Uh, I mean, this this was really interesting. And I thought about, you know, with the weapon system alone, there's obviously going to be a ton of build variations between players, right, Richie? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. Just, you know, your, people are going to have different weapon sets that they... Uh, that they that are drawn to, and you know, certain weapons are going to be you know better in certain situations. Some for AOE, some for mobility, different things like that. And you know, that right there with your you know, you're not even including that you get to add utility skills and your elite skill and your healing skill and your F1 abilities. It's it's pretty complex, even before you add the trade system. Talking about before even the trade system, like talking about the, with the weapons switching and, and all this. How I mean, it's gonna. I don't know. Do you think that there's gonna be like you know? an elitistasura.com for people to just go and get their like you know their 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 mega build and just kind of build it out like that well i'll, I'll tell you a little story about about that i um people are going to do that there will abs- absolutely be forum posts and people theory crafting and coming out with special builds but you know in my my, my limited play time uh I, I tried some competitive pvp on a on a thief and i was getting my butt kicked so i thought i'd be smart and look up some builds and trait trait builds and stuff like that online and i found some 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 posts that sounded like they knew what they were talking about i punched it all in and uh voila i was horrible at pvp still <laughs> so uh, i mean <laughs> In other games, you know, in other games, like the research is almost half the battle. You know, you, you plug in the right numbers, you know where to put those right points, and and then math happens, and uh, you know, you're you're suddenly you're suddenly better. But in this game, my my experience so far, and it's been you know pretty limited. Uh, it, it there's a lot to your skill and knowing what you're doing rather than just plugging in the the stats. Now, uh, what do you, do you think that the trade system is going to add like even a larger layer of depth on top of that as well? It's it's gigantic. The tra- I mean, it's like the trade system is something that they, the, you know, kind of the thing that we saw, you know, the most recently. But you know, that's like where most of the customization comes in. I mean, there's these five trait lines and 70 points you get to spend into them, and each trait line can go up to 30. And you know, at, at certain points along each line, you get these choices of like 10 different perks, and and those perks are different for each line. It's like it's an insane amount of customization. It's 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 crazy. You know, when we did the hit on this, uh, uh, John Peter says in the interview, yeah, we, we got skills all figured out. We got those working, the balance, everything. Then we threw in traits, and it all got messed up again. So. And that's how are they going to balance for something like this? Like, there's so many variables here. Like, or, or is the case that you don't necessarily always have balance? 
game's not going to come out until 2014. <laughs> That's what it is. Because, like you said, the trade system sounds like it exponentially makes the math just so much more complex. Like, I don't really know how they, they – they, I don't know. It just sounds mind-boggling. But I hate I hate numbers, so. I think it's something that they're going to have to adjust on the fly. They're going to have to launch with what they have, and they're going to find out what people do and don't do. Like, we're, I did a little rift hit when they were talking about – the. You know, they did their big dungeon. They were planning it before the game started, before they even knew what people could do. So it, it was a little off, and it's going to be kind of the same way with this. They're just going to have to go in with what they have, hope it more or less works, and just tweak it on the fly. Richie, you played Guild Wars 1, right? Yep. Is there a big, the big RP community, right? Yeah, there's there's quite a bit of people that, that, that get into that. There's tons of different uh, emotes and costumes and different things that um, and people throw, you know, parties and celebrations and uh, all the time in different districts and stuff like that. Do you yeah. think do you think we're gonna see do you think we'd see players like RP in the RP community kind of say like I'm a Norn warrior and I use an axe and just like and just stick with the axe and just kind of not even utilize the uh, the weapon switching? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and I, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I played uh, I played a Death Knight in uh, in WoW, and for the longest time, even though I knew that statistically, you know, wielding two one-handed weapons was uh, uh, was better uh, mathematically, um, I didn't still do wanted, it. I thought a Death. What'd you say? You didn't do it. You just thought a Death Knight. I, should... I, did, I didn't do it. I, well, I resisted it for a long time. Let me put it that way. I, I really thought a Death Knight should have a big honk and you know two-handed axe and, and kill things like that. So, uh, and I'm not even a big RPer, so I, I can imagine there's going to be people who say, no, no, you know what? I, I I like having a sword and a torch, and that's that's what I like. So I don't care what's the best thing. What do you got? The Aragorn build. <laughs> sword and the torch. Yeah. But then you got to wonder. Like, ring race on fire. I think you, you got to wonder. Like, do you think you're going to be gimped if you if you kind of go that route? Well, I think it's depending on what what are you going to be doing. It's the, I, mean, I think that's the big thing. I mean, if you're going into the, the the competitive PvP, well, yeah, maybe you need to listen a little bit more about what the what the the, the meta game is with the builds and stuff like that. But if you're just out exploring the world and doing dynamic events, and you know what, do do what you want, play what you want. World versus world, same way. It's a big un, unbalanced. It's going to be a big unbalanced unbalanced frenzy. And you know what? So what? Just go in there with whatever you want and have fun. The other thing I really hadn't thought of with all the traits, with all this, with all the skills, and, and, then, the, and then the weapon switching. When I played in beta, I, I, I got the weapon switching. And I was like, oh, this is cool. But then I kind of forgot about it a little bit just because I was just so into the game and I was just playing it. I, I wasn't switching a ton. Because now it could kind of get, especially in PvP, it's going to get pretty complex where you've now got to remember your full rotation and then flip your, you know, to a different weapon. And then everything else on your skill bar changes again and you have a wholly different new set. Yeah, I think that I, I think it could be a little bit, but I think we're also kind of used to the whole. I mean, we're kind of used to the whole. Uh, I've got fifty skills on my bar or whatever, so having to remember, you know, what, what goes with your different weapons might not be that bad. And and hopefully they'll they'll arrange it so that it's largely like when I like when I play League of Legends. You know, my first button is like my general attack. My second is like an AOE. My third is a defensive. My fourth is my ultimate. So I, I kind of no matter what champion I'm playing, I sort of follow along those lines. And hopefully. I'll make the weapons kind of match up those same kind of things. Here's my long range attack. Here's my AOE, whatever. So I'm gonna have my uh, my Ed Park, aka Tallgrim, keybind guide in front of me, like like a little map of just like <laughs> remember where you should be, like an old man. I remember where number one is and number two. All right, next up, John. Uh, he said people think, oh, that guy's down, so he's out. And you get a lot of people who say things like, it seems dumb that you have to kill someone twice. But you don't, because you haven't actually killed them when they're downed. Richie, what did you think of the down state? I actually loved it. I, I thought it was an awesome new thing. Yeah, I, I, I definitely see this as a mechanic that's going to, you know, come under some criticism from some people. But I... I, I agree that um, it, it seemed awesome, especially like in PvE scenario. Like there, there was a time when I got, I was fighting three mobs at once. I almost killed the first one when they actually knocked me to the down state. And I was able to kill him, get back up, throw a heal skill, and I actually was able to beat all three because of that. And, you know, the downside is for every epic moment you have like that, you have like 20 times where you don't get up from a down state, yeah. <laughs> but it's cool to have those, those moments in there. It's a little bit different in the, in the PvP side where, um, you know, you, you, people people are watching for you in downstate all the time, and you know it's they, they execute you like crazy because it's just so much fun to jump up in there and go ah! <laughs> and finish people. I mean, yeah. They, 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 go ahead, Jason. I will say that's actually tough for me in PvP because I'm so conditioned from all these years of okay, once I get your health bar down to zero, I go away and go do something else. 
now I gotta realize I gotta stay on you, or I gotta, you know, I gotta still pay attention to you. Yeah, you yes, gotta you go to over and get that last the killing blow and to really put them down. I don't know. I found it really kind of refreshing and fun. I don't. I guess the, the 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 fear is possibly that you know the players start feeling that it's almost an annoying mechanic that you've got to you know you feel like you're killing the same guy twice. I didn't feel that in beta though. I didn't feel that. Yeah, the tricky thing is going to be is knowing what all of your opponents' um, downstate abilities are because it's not just like knowing yours. Because the thief has a really tricky one where they can basically teleport to a random location nearby while they're downed and be invisible for a few seconds. So I found that people forgot about you, you know, didn't even know what that was, didn't look for you so many times. And sometimes you could teleport like behind a bush or something. And you're just like, yes, I'm there. They're never going to see me. And it's just so you have to know what all the different abilities are. It's going gonna, it's gonna to add a different dimension to it for what sure. About, and what about from a gameplay perspective? I mean, I found, the, I found it actually fun. Like I almost found it like a white knuckle moment. Like you go down and you fall and all of a sudden this buttons coming you're just like ah, ah, like you're just like smashing on your keyboard and I actually found like a fun mechanic I mean did you find it actually like you were having fun when you were doing it yeah I mean it's well, the first time you do it you're frantic you're like you're trying to read these skills you're like what do these skills do I'm hitting them all and I don't know what they do I don't know what they do and hopefully something happens but yeah it's it's it definitely uh, it, it's a it's a tense just, moment you, you just keep spamming that. one just keep spamming one yeah <laughs> Well, that's what it's sort of like, but then you've got four, and it's kind of interesting. Like, it's, it's going to be, I don't just know. Just keep spamming I, two. There you go. Just keep <laughs> spamming two. Just keep spamming five. Uh, finally, John said, we didn't want to eliminate the build making. Uh, we still have it, and there's tons of it, but we wanted it to feel like part of what your build is comes down to mastering that build, not just making it. So don't, 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 don't start elitistasaurus.com just yet. Uh, I feel like that part of the game has worked all, almost uh, more than anything else. It really feels like you have to master a build, which is really satisfying when you do. And I think from what you said, Richie, I mean, that, it's almost like testament of exactly what you're talking about. You went and found a build, obviously worked really well for somebody else, and you still suck. That's right. Oh. <laughs> I still <laughs> suck. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't just plug in numbers that you read. You haven't, done a, knowing. So you haven't done a show with me yet. So I, I, you know, you're, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> This is my, let the griefing, is my, let the griefing begin. This uh, is an honor. I, I got, I got my, I got my baptism by Ga Gary Gannon. <laughs> <laughs> you still suck. No, but that, that's actually uh, like you're like the like you told a great story for exactly what we're talking about here. That actually just like you know really sets home exactly. That's that's a great thing that you know it doesn't seem like you just plug in this exact build and you're just like in God mode all of a sudden. No, it does not work. It, at least for the thief and for what I tried, it did not work. I, I didn't. I didn't actually feel any better. Uh, you have to really know what the abilities are, what traits you pick. I mean, because for example, you when when you're when you're. I, I'll just speak from the thief because that's what I played the most. Um, you know, you can kind of spec your character to do to be very effective with poisons. Or you can, you know, spec your your thief to be very uh, effective coming out of stealth, you know. And so if if you're if you're specced for uh, if your traits are spec for poison and you don't put poisons as your utility skills, hmm, there might be a problem here. So you really you really gotta you gotta know the whole thing and how to use it and how to how to play. I mean, I do hope that this is a really you know sort of easy to play, hard to master scenario. I mean, I know that's sort of such a catchphrase of, of for for games to sort of kind of tout around. Because uh, it sounds great, because it sounds really alluring. I really hope that, that 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 stays true, and it doesn't sort of rear its head that hey, this is the master build. You just got to learn to play it, and it'll take you like fifteen minutes. I think it's going to be like I, I think it's going to be the, the that catchphrase where you know if if someone you know doesn't really want to get all complicated about it, or it's too much for them, they can stick to one weapon set and a set of utility skills that they really like, and they can really get pretty decent at that. And then there's going to be the players who know how to you know flip their weapons on the fly and 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 go nuts. And uh, there's so much depth to it. And I think that the second that someone says, "Hey, this is the best thing in the world," there's going to be someone that can counter that. Or you know again. I'll bring up like the torch or the warhorn or these unsung weapons and stuff like that. All of a sudden, the people will come out of nowhere like, what? What is that? Where is that coming from? There's just so many options. And somebody will find some little you know, nugget of, of gold somewhere and, and change up the metagame. Jason, where do you sit in this in the whole mastering your build sort of scenario? I've seen bad players in every game who felt they knew their build and just were you know, bad at PvP as he was. So, <laughs> now he's griefing. I, I don't now. know. That's necessarily a, a, a thing unique to Guild Wars 2. It's just, yeah, you hope people will actually, like, read what their skills do rather than just punch them into their computer and then people don't, one all the time. People one, don't one, one. read. They come to Game Breaker TV and watch. 
That's true. No, we, we, we are contributing to the decline of America. Hey, Yay. I do what I can. <laughs> All right, let's do some viewer questions. First up, from Mark Robichaud. Mark says, uh, even though the character level scales down when you hit a lower level area, is there any incentive to go back and play in such an area? What do you think, Richie? Well, uh, you know, it's, well, I mean, obviously you can, if you want to see different storylines, different events, different lore that you, you missed maybe the first time, there's that draw. But if that doesn't do it for you, I mean, doing dynamic events will earn you karma no matter where you're doing it or what level you're doing it at. And karma is, you know, useful for every level character. So uh, yeah, absolutely there is incentive in, in that uh, in that form. And also the, the loot drops that... Uh, come off of, you know, these different things, they're tailored to the level that you are, not to the level of the content that you're doing. So there's always that incentive. That is an in extremely yeah. important aspect of this. That, yeah. That's what it's got to be, because you play, like I play Rift, and they're, they're going to change this apparently, but if I have my level 50 guy and he goes on to a level 30 zone and fights off a bunch of invaders, whatever, I can know what that, <clears throat> excuse me, I spent like half an hour going through the zone doing all this stuff, and I get like 12 playing right. Right. You know, my character's got 10,000, so yeah, he gets 12 more for doing all that stuff. But if you can go down to those other level, those lower level areas and actually get level appropriate rewards for it, then that's great. I completely agree, especially with the dynamic events. And then, you know, you're going to get new buddies to come in. And I don't know, I always get new buddies to come in. They're new players, things like that, new guildies. You go play with them and you kind of help them out and you run through those areas. And I'm really glad to see that you're going to be able to run through those areas and get scaled content to you. And it's like you said, it's not just like, oh, I got 10 of, I got 10 playing, right? That's ridiculous. So, all right, next up, this question from Mike. Mike says, do you think ArenaNet has implemented all of the skills already? We saw elites in the recent beta videos that were not present in the first beta. So could this mean that the skill pools for professions will be expanded? What do you think, Jason? Do you think that there's more to come? Hmm. Probably. I mean, I, from what I've seen of like the skill list that I've looked at, it, it, it seemed a little small to me. Just I know that there's not a lot there, but it just seemed like there, there's room for more. Like there are only like whatever, like three healing skills per profession. It just seems like there could be more to a lot of those. And, Maybe they're going to try to sneak a few more in before the before the launch. What do you think, Richie? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think they're done. I wouldn't expect that you're going to see huge huge amounts of new skills added to a specific profession or, or whatnot. But yeah, we're 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 still we're still seeing major changes between builds and uh, new things popping up all over the place. So there there should be some uh, some new surprises here and there as we go through the beta events. Kind of interesting. I think John Peters even talked about in, in that article talked about how. He, they change some of the the necro abilities, so they might not necessarily be new skills altogether. But just they'll take whatever the three is for a necro staff and change that to a different skill or something. They could do stuff like that too. And I can imagine that they want to do some testing where they kind of like you know give you some not a, I don't want to say a limited avail amount of abilities because we probably have most of them, but actually see how players are us using them and utilizing them. And then as they implement a few few new abilities, they can see how that affects like things like your rotation and things like that, and gather gather data that way. And that's actually kind of recreate the user experience from a data point of view. Wait, wait, they, they want to do what? They, they want to actually test in a beta test? Is that what those are for? Crazy talk. I, I thought they were just previews. <laughs> it's a demo. Yeah, there you go. It's a, it's, a, it's a free demo. It's a free demo. That's it. When it's in beta, it's free, right? Why am I paying? All right, next up, La... Henrik Nordgren. Obviously going to play a Nord. <laughs> Nord. 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 Nord's a Skyrim. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, Henrik says, uh, what will be the standout parts of Guild Wars 2 making players stick with the game? What do you think, Richie? I think for me, the, the thing that makes this game the most sticky is the fact that you, it's so easy to play with who you want to play with. I, I mean, we, we, we talked about the scaling down and, and, and that kind of thing, but there's also elements like if you want to go do a dungeon, you don't have to wait for a healer to come online, or you know, you don't have this huge, you know, because it's not really a gear-based game, you don't have this huge discrepancy of, oh, I'm, I, I way out gear that zone, I want to do this, oh, I don't have the gear for that, and different things like that. And the fact that you can visit people on other servers, and, 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 and you know, it just makes it easy for you to just play with who you want to play, when you want to play with it, and, and really, an MMO is supposed to be you know, a social experience and everything like that, so I think that's going to make it very sticky for me. How about you, Jason? Well, Richie took my number one answer, so I'm going to go with 1B, which is the, uh, <laughs> the dynamic events, definitely being able to... I, I actually kind of wrote about this a little bit. I said the fact that it's, it's going to have a longer shelf life than your typical PvE, where 
ages level up, and when you level up an alt, it's going to be exactly the same. Here, you're going to get a lot of different stuff as you're leveling new characters or as you're going back to visit the old stuff. So it's always going to feel different, and it's going to be, in our case, where you're at one part of a chain in a dynamic event, and there's going to be another dynamic event that's in a different part of a chain, and you might overlap one or the other by going from one to the other. It'll be, you'll at least tackle them in a, in a different order than what you did the other time through, even if you've already done the even if you've already done that dynamic event in that chain. And I think one thing for me uh, that you guys, neither of you kind of brought up, though, was just basically the PvP, right? The, 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 you know, the, the ranked PvP of just, just uh, really an eSport, hopefully. Of the, like, that's really their core of kind of tracking with like, that leaderboards, and they pay a lot of attention to that. We, don't, we haven't seen a lot of MMOs in recent history kind of really focusing on that, or they're just PvP-centric games, you know, but... You know, Rift. You know, Star Wars doesn't really kind of have too many tools in there for PVPers. Rift doesn't really. They've kind of been PVE centric games. So I think that's going to be really sticky for a lot of players as well. If they finally have that, they got to get that spectator mode up though. Because I would spend, I, I've spent sometimes like an hour or more just watching stuff, watching PVP in Guild Wars One. I you agree. Know, just watching it and seeing how some people are doing. I agree on spectator mode. All right, last question from Vanessa Boyer. <laughs> Vanessa is cute. I might be biased just a little bit if you've ever seen my dog. Maybe. Uh, Vanessa says, why is the collector's edition so damn expensive? I think we kind of went over that. Figurine, book, in-game stuff, metal case, DVDs. I don't know. Now, be even better if they, if they get a box. And the, the box they're shipping with is probably big enough, but if they maybe get another one... Just a little bit bigger and actually fit an Asura in it. Asura, Asura, that'd be cool. A live Asura. A live Asura. How about the Gollum battle suit? I want a, a life-size one of those. That'd be good. Oh. Remember, uh, it was like, a little, like around the end of last year, uh, Big Point did a thing where, with Battlestar Galactica where you could win like a life-size Cylon. Oh, I remember so that. I wanted there that thing go. so bad. Could you imagine that in the Game Breaker studio? <laughs> There's your macro out? transaction. A battle, a golem battle suit. <laughs> I didn't even talk about micro transactions or macro transactions or anything. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jason Winter, come over to GameBreaker.tv and read all his amazing, amazing work that he does every single day writing for GameBreaker.tv. I don't have a lower third for you for Guild Guildcast. That's okay. Nobody can pronounce my Twitter anyway. It's J A Y E L U U. I'll even put it in chat in a little bit here. There you go. He'll put it in chat right. for you to follow him. You all should follow Mr. Jason Winter and his blog. What's your blog? Uh, JasonWinter.wordpress.com. That's pretty damn I'm easy working, to remember. Uh, tomorrow, I'll, tomorrow I'll probably on the site. I'll probably have my uh, first impressions of uh, Tribes Ascend. I'm playing Can't. a lot today. I've been playing a lot. Can't wait for that. I haven't gotten any time in Tribes Ascend, but. Funny, I had a meeting the other day, and we were talking about that. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, we do video game talk. They're like, tribes. I was like, whoa, yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, Richard Procopio, go over to Massively.com. Where can they follow you? They can Actually, follow me on Twitter at Richie Procopio. Look at you. You've got your own lower third. You've been, you're like a veteran on this show. I go away, and they just got all new people. Like, man, yeah. where's that bearded guy, Sean Schuster? Where'd Elizabeth go? They will be back. Don't worry. They'll be back. We're just rotating people in and out. Thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. Awesome show. You Thank can follow you. me on the Twitter at Gary Gannon. And, of course, you can follow GameBreaker TV at GameBreaker TV. You can come over all day. Uh, we do all kinds of other crap, you know, news things and videos and just, <laughs> I don't know. Crap. Crap. Just crap. Come, and come to GameBreaker TV for the crap. See you next week.